I'm really happy to be here physically. I'm just going to talk while she gets just, me up yep. there. Um, as Jay said, I work at IDC. We're a market research and consulting company, and I have been uh, working on smart cities since about 2009. So uh, I'm here to basically talk today about why I think this is a really historic moment for smart cities. And I'm really happy to be here to talk to you about that. This is my passion and what I've been working on for a really long time. And I had a really hard time organizing my thoughts for this presentation. There's so much going on. There's so much to talk about. Hopefully I make some sense as we go through this. There are some text heavy slides in there because I really was sort of like thinking about so many things. But what I'm trying to do is, um, oh, I'm not up yet. Okay, I thought I was seeing now it's now it's hurting me. Um, what I try to do if you go to the next slide on the agenda. Oh, I can. <laughs> so I might fall off the stage and that will be a physical problem we have to deal with. Is it working? Where did I point it? Okay, next slide. Okay. Um, it's really interesting because at the very end of this deck, I talk about how hybrid experiences are really hard and I just feel like I'm just gonna go to the side and be like, see, and everyone's gonna be like, yeah. Um, so uh, back to the point. I really think that this is a time of incredible opportunities for transformation and digital transformation. And that's really what smart cities are all about. Um, I'm organizing the thinking around this into what I'm calling accelerators, disruptors, and inhibitors, because I think all of these are coming together um, to create sort of this perfect storm for 2022. And you'll hear all these phrases when I talk about things, oh, digital resiliency and digital trust and the infrastructure bill and all these things. But I think that's what's really exciting um, in terms of what's happening and what's going on. Um, and then I have a few real life examples just to say, you know, People are doing things, cities are doing things, towns, counties, states are doing things. Um, and then I wanna talk about sort of what's next and how we can pull these initiatives together into a more strategic, enterprise-wide, coordinated smart city plan. Okay, so next slide. Um, so I just always start with this because I want you to know what I mean by smart cities. First of all, I don't just mean cities. We work with towns, we work with counties, we work with states. Basically anything sub-national is how we put it when we um, talk at a global level. Um, and I don't just mean IoT. So my biggest pet peeve lately is that everyone talks about smart cities and they immediately say sensors and IoT. And as we all know in government, there's about a thousand backend software related <laughs> things that need to happen that could be really transformational. So one of the things I just wanna say is it's you know, everything that involves digital technologies, emerging technologies, and it's specifically designed to kind of link those, um, the technology with the outcomes you want. And we tend to talk about them in efficiency and finance and sustainability and environmental outcomes and community engagement and social outcomes. So I just wanna say that that's really what I'm focused on is how we catalyze that kind of transformation in the context of government. So if we go to the next slide, um, I showed this before, I think I spoke um, in March of uh, 20 this year, and I just wanted to bring it up again to make the point that when we talk about digital transformation, the other thing that I think people get wrong, usually the vendors, um, is that they expect something really fast to happen. So we are always hearing from our vendor clients like, oh, I'm getting so much pressure. There's, we're not getting enough growth. They're not people, the cities aren't buying enough quickly, and we're, so, this is supposed to be so hot. I'm like, Hot doesn't mean fast in government. Hot means like slow, steady, incremental progress, right? So I still think that as we talk about digital transformation, we're still talking about that steady progress. And I guess to this tying into the point about being opportunities, we still need progress. We still need to dedicate ourselves to really working through these things. So I just wanted to show this again to show a little bit about the real progress we've seen over time. And um, in 2014, I, I created a smart city maturity model. It has five phases. It's pretty much stood the test of time. It's in version 3.0, and I'll talk about it a little more later. But what this shows is when we interview um, US 
towns, cities, counties, um, and we benchmark them against that maturity model, uh, the dark blue is showing 2014 and the purple is showing um, 2020. And so we can really see that going from ad hoc, which is sort of that kind of, I'm just gonna do some stuff and then market it and say, we did something, we're smart, we have a bench, um, it to more opportunistic, like, okay, let's take advantage of certain things we wanna do to going all the way to repeatable processes and repeatable projects to managed where it's very coordinated across departments, et cetera. You can actually see that in 2020, that purple bar, there's been a lot of progress. So we see that slow and steady march. And so the question is, what do we do today? Uh, Professor Goldsmith said this, in the context of everything being much more complicated. things that I'm calling disruptors, which are like, they're kind of helping, but they're also problems. So I think we all know what some of these accelerators are, right? There's government money and it's coming. And I'm gonna talk about Texas and you guys are gonna get a lot of it, right? That's a huge, huge thing to think about. Um, we also have a lot of tech adop adoption and changing consumer demand. That's putting a lot of pressure on, on you guys to do things differently. We see the suppliers being really innovative and really trying to meet some of the demand, a lot of really good, good solutions out there. Um, and I think we also see this, the governments themselves from when I talk to you all, you've really started to understand that things need to happen and there's a lot more openness to being innovative and to taking some risks. And I think lastly, there's just a ton of problems with aging systems and technical debt and that's just gotta force modernization. So those are the things, and I'm gonna talk about them a little more that are accelerating. On the inhibitor side, procurement policy, they can't keep up. It's really hard. Um, it brings up all sorts of issues like governance and trust. You know, If your policies are behind and your public doesn't know how you're gonna use a drone or, or video, then they freak out and they inhibit progress, right? Because they don't understand what's happening. And that really ties into um, you know, sort of the, the staffing and the ability to respond and the fact that we're really competing for a lot of technical skills out there. And I know that a lot of municipalities are really struggling. I'm struggling. I have two openings. So if anyone wants to come work in my group, I would love to have people from government uh, join the team. Um, and then there's these things which are disruptors, right? There's like weather events. There's the grids, the power grids that go down. There's flooding, right? These are problems but they also kind of accelerate thinking about change. And so those are some key, I think key disruptors are gonna happen. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'm just gonna spend a few moments talking about the accelerators. And if we go to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to point out, next slide please, thank you. Um, the point I made about consumer adoption, I talked about this a little bit as well in March, I'm reiterating some things here. Truly, truly, and I feel like you probably know this, but the public has changed how they want to interact with government because now they've seen what can happen and they can see that they can do things virtually and remotely and nobody wants to go back. People, you know, we have did a study, 2000 uh, US residents, you know, 31% and this include all ages want to replace in-person visits with virtual visits. Now this was 2020. I believe this would be higher in 2021. We're gonna do another study. They just, nobody wants to go in. Um, so I think that creates this, this problem of a hybrid experience like we're having now. Uh, they want the same experiences they have. They want to be able to do things seamlessly. They're increasing their use. We've seen a big increase in use in things like mobile payments, mobile apps, video, telemedicine, and um, first time users are changing too. So now you have all age groups. If they can access it, they're doing it online, right? Maybe sometimes not so great, but it's happening. Um, and then you have this idea that over time, what we've noticed in the government systems, you guys have taken something that was not designed to take in 
edge information or be mobile or whatever, do a new workflow or new process. And you've basically like tweaked it and adjusted it and customized it over time, right? And now everything is kind of a, a little bit of a mess, I think. You have really customized projects. They're risky, they're fragile, they're not updated, they're not secure. And once you try to go in and do these more complicated things about online and digital and automation, more and more challenges happen. This is a waste. This is a waste. You don't have enough storage. You can't hold your data. The software doesn't work. You've got to start to think about just modernizing and going to new, you got to migrate a little bit, I think. So I just think this is a huge push because there's going to be more risks. There's going to be more security attacks and there's a lot of fragility in the system. And secondly, I've talked to cities who are saying, well, we have six developers, but 90% of their time is spent answering internal support calls about our products rather than development. They're just support because our processes and our software are so tricky and breaking all the time. So this is really a waste and we don't have a lot of staffing resources to waste. So I think we really need to think about this accelerator. So if we go to the next slide, the other one of course is the money. Uh, money is coming. Um, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, okay, the infrastructure bill is a thousand pages long. I have not poured over every page. This is like a little bit of a money summary. So if you're going to ask me like, what is it exactly hold? And the, I'm going to be like, I don't, I don't know yet. I got it. It's going to take a while. But lots of other people have done great, great analysis of this. Um, but I just wanted to point out that this is, this is a huge accelerator. There is cybersecurity funding everywhere in here. There is broadband funding. Texas is going to get a ton of money for broadband. Um, there's so much here. And you may think, oh, transportation, that's great. I'm going to like, you know, do pavement. No, think of the digital overlay and the modernization efforts that have to happen with all of these areas and how you can embed these new things into these systems. There's so much going on in this bill. Um, and it's just a huge acceleration. It's, 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 I don't know, I can't say enough about it. But if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to point out a few things about Texas. Just out of curiosity, has anyone like read the bill? Or let, have you read the bill? Good job. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, um, so I just sort of pulled this off. This is on whitehouse.gov. This is, this is no big analysis of me, but I did want to point out the fact that it's interesting that the funding mechanisms are not all formula, right? The, they're more complex. There's going to be discretionary and competitive grants. So this goes to this idea of really thinking strategically and making that progress because you're going to have to do something to get some of this money. Not all of it is just formula based, right? So that really ties into starting to think strategically about the progress and, and your plan and what you want to do because you're going to have to go out and compete for some of this money. Um, but if we just look at the formula funding alone, right, 3.3 billion targeted to Texas for public transportation, 408 million targeted for the expansion of EV charging network with the opportunity to apply for some grant funding. Um, and then, you know, significant money, 53 million for uh, wildfires, 42 million for cyber attack protection, lots of money. Now it's probably going to go through the state and then you guys are going to get it or, or however it's going to work. But what are you going to do with all this money? You have to have a plan. You know, money sounds great until you get it. And then you realize you can't track it. It's, you don't know how it can be used exactly. And it's all over the place. So this is an accelerator, but it's something that's really making us think about transformation, I think, more clearly. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to point out this, this fact about broadband exp expansion as an accelerator. Um, smart cities rest on connectivity because pretty much everything is connected and digital. Information flows from all sorts of sensors and video and devices, and you can't access the cloud without a good connection. So a lot of times we hear, oh, the cloud, it just doesn't work for us. I'm like, it's not the, it's not AWS, it's not micro, it's like you don't have a good bandwidth, like you can't actually access it properly. All these things really rest on secure available um, connectivity. So I think this is transformative as well in terms of what we're saying. We're, we're seeing, gonna see a lot of ex, um, increase in spending, uh, you know, up to 3.4 billion and a big increase um, in just local government spending. 
And it's gonna take, again, that strategic thinking about it because it's not gonna be one type of network, right? There's lots of different networks, lots of different ways things are gonna to need to use different types of connectivity. And so depending on your use case and what you wanna do, you're gonna to have to have sort of a plan in terms of what kind of um, connections you're gonna be using. Um, and, and I think when we look at cities, just because I, I think the title Jay gave was I was gonna put data, here's some data, right? 41% of US cities are saying that, you know, the cost of deploying and um, broadband is, is inhibiting their deployment, is inhibiting scaling. Well, that is gonna be partially solved to some degree, right? Maybe there's not enough money, but there's certainly more money. So that's really important in terms of scale. Um, and they also report they just don't, can't handle the traffic. So that also should be something that you can think about resolving. What are you gonna do with all the traffic that you suddenly can absorb and all the data that's coming in? Um, and I think really interesting is how this is transformative to some of these disruptors that we think about around digital equity, which is you have 14% of Texans who don't have an internet subscription. Um, you know, that, that could really change. There's a lot of money, $100 million that's earmarked here to provide broadband coverage across the state. And there's also um, eligibility for this affordable connectivity benefit. So this kind of um, area that we talk about all the time around digital inclusion is really potentially over the next five years, right? Because this funding goes over five years, going to be a huge accelerator to adoption. And you all have to be ready with the services. You know, I've got broadband, great. Now I want services. I want to consume everything over that network, right? What are you offering? Side note, it took me half an hour to get here because I walked out of my hotel and I had no connectivity on my phone. I was like, what? I, I literally was like, I don't know how to get to the library. I don't know where I am. I was text, then I couldn't text anybody. So I had to walk around. Then I finally got it. And I was texting people because it sent me all over and it was very confusing. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that was so odd not to have connect, like not to have cellular, right? For like, two minutes. <laughs> so I think we need to think, I was literally like, I'm never going to make it. Um, uh, so, uh, okay, we can go to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about disruptors, because I think these are where the big challenges come in. And sometimes we forget that the digital overlay and digital transformation are part of that smart city narrative around these disruptors. And we tend to think of only physical infrastructure, and we're forgetting that Everything is instrumented. It's not just SCADA systems. And this all is part of the smart city discussion. How am I doing on time? Am I okay? Okay, uh, so next slide. So um, we hear a lot about resiliency, right? Um, and I think when we think about resiliency, maybe people think about buildings swaying in the wind for earthquakes or flood protection or, or critical infrastructure like grid staying up. Um, but all of those things are going are relying and do better if there's technology involved. So I think we need to really think about digital resiliency and how technology supports physical resiliency. Um, and the fact is, I think this is an enormous disruptor because we know that nothing's stopping, that we're constantly going to continue to be under attack for cyber events, the, the severe weather events are going to continue. Um, you know, there's gonna be everyday issues that are events, there's just gonna be ongoing crises. So we need to be prepared and we need to embrace this sort of resiliency as part of this process of digital transformation. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, I wanted to put this up here because, you know, future installations, installations being bases, we talked to the uh, government quite a bit about future installations because smart bases are smart cities. Um, oh, one slide back, please. Thank you. Um, and what I find really interesting is the attention being played, you know, being paid by the DOD on sustainability and resilience around environmental resilience. And I think because everybody here and in government is the first line of response and emergency response and support to your public and your stakeholders, we need to also be hearing and thinking about what they're saying, right? Which is, um, these events are socially disruptive. They are, you know, they're kind of make everyone feel uneasy about our social fabric when there's flooding or they can't reach somebody or the network goes down. Um, they are also being used as vulnerabilities by bad actors. 
So one of the most interesting things that the DOD will say is like, you know, we can predict weather events really well. So we know that like our bad, you know, bad actors around the world are purposely putting out misinformation on social media to time with a vet weather event in a couple of days because they know it's destabilizing for us. So they came up with a whole big uh, climate assessment tool and they started to really look into this and, and do a bunch of indicators and I listed them up here. And really the whole point of the slide is like, if, if smart bases are being worried about how they're being impacted by you know, weather events and climate events, and if the military is thinking, wow, we're gonna be deployed a lot more to help cities because these things are happening, we all should be paying a lot of attention because we're, you guys are actually there trying to help people immediately. So I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, and, and if we go to the next slide, the other thing that I think is this disruptor that needs to be kind of part And I think um, that's what we need to strengthen, right? Because every day their lives are impacted by what's happening with municipalities and they need to trust what's happening. Um, I have a side comment about this. This is not in my notes, which I'm not using anyway. But I um, was taking a taxi to the airport and my, the driver was Venezuelan. And he was listening to rap, which I thought was about religion, but actually was a political rap. <laughs> So I was like, what is this about? He was like, oh, this guy, he's, he's been killed. He was like a political rapper. Um, and so he was saying he's from Venezuela and we were talking about this and he was saying, I was like, you know, I always think about this when I travel broadly all over the world. And I, I have these feelings, I have these experiences where people are like, you know, you're going to go somewhere, you're going to stay in a line for a long time. You're not really sure you're going to get what you're supposed to get. You're probably going to have to pay some people along the way. And I'm like, you know, that really doesn't happen in the United States. Like, I was telling this guy, I'm like, isn't it funny? You're from Venezuela. If you go to the DMV, you're going to pay your $60 and maybe it won't be pleasant, but you're actually going to get your license. And the guy behind the stand is not going to ask you for $3,000, which is what he told me it costs him <laughs> in Venezuela to try to get a license. So at a fundamental level, we've got really important structures around policy and governance that are trustworthy in this country, and they might slow us down a little bit, but corruption actually slows people down a lot more. But I do think the destabilizing factors are really, are really here and they're trying, and they're trying to erode a lot of that trust, and we need to make a play to fight back. And technology, cybersecurity, all those things are way to, ways to do that. Anyway, my point about trust is that it's not just security and privacy, there's a whole lot of other things I think that go into it. Like I was just saying ethics, right? You're using data ethically, you're behaving ethically, you're, um, you're in compliance with regulations, people can expect that you're gonna do what you're gonna do, you're managing risk, you're transparent, you're letting the public know, um, and you're engaging them. So I think all of this is like a really important wrapper when we think about transformation, because you need the buy-in of the community and you need them to trust you so that implementations are adopted and you, you get the right feedback. All right, you guys still with me? <laughs> Am I talking too fast? All right, good. Uh, I was up at like five this morning, like, no, I'm going to change all of this and I don't know what I'm doing. So, you know, um, so I just wanted to put up a couple real life examples. Um, I, I, you know, I think Professor Goldsmith really did a lot of examples, so maybe I won't spend a ton of time here, but I really was trying to show the breadth of transformation initiatives. And then I want to make a point that silent initiatives are terrible and all, all of these are great. Like we got to do something better around coordination. So um, that's what this is for. And they're from our Smart City Awards, which we've done for the past four years. We do it globally. We collect applications. I will say this year, not a lot of, not, not really any, except for one application from the great state of Texas. So I don't know, you guys gotta, gotta do some more there. Uh, it's free, it's not hard. Um, but 
but I think they really um, showcase what people are what people are doing in the diversity. So I just wanted to put a few examples up there. Um, one which I really thought was interesting was from New York City. It's called like Heat Seek, and basically they put smart thermometers in buildings, not a high cost effort, but they're trying to do a whole housing equity issue. And they basically were like, you know, some landlords are not giving the heat that they're supposed to give for residents and they're not complying. And especially in public housing, maybe we're having heating issues as well. So they put them in, they were able to track it and they can go and basically protect the public and the tenants from abuses um, by landlords. And I thought that now that is potentially transformative to some of these people's lives. Maybe they're new, maybe they, they are low income, maybe they don't feel comfortable complaining, right? Rents are high in New York. If they have a good place, they're not going to say anything. So I think this is a great example of, of some of the things that we can do. Um, the other one I really liked was, um, and this ties into the fact that you're going to need a bunch of money for electric charging. Uh, Boulder is doing this bi-directional charging so the Nissan Leaf, apparently you can plug it into a building and you can actually charge the building, not just charge the battery from the grid. I don't know, you guys had some electricity problems. It seems like this is some micro grid option that could be a backup, right? You know, you got some charging, you got some electric vehicles, something goes down, you can plug the vehicle in and get, and they were saying it charges like 24 hours, uh, three-story building, something like that. That's incredible. Right, that's transformative. That offers all sorts of things when we think about resiliency. Um, uh, quickly, City of Philadelphia, they did AI for road inspections. This I'm pointing out, $30,000. $30,000, they I think did 1200 miles of infrastructure um, analysis for the roads that they've never done before. Got a complete sense of like, I don't know, a third of their streets, so not, not everything, but, um, it didn't cost them that much, but this is really important for how they're going to plan and think about their transportation. And now they're going to get money, right, from this infrastructure bill for transportation. They actually know where they can spend it and apply it, right? That's really interesting. Um, the last last two I'll just mention, because Harris County, I had to mention them, they, they won an award this year for e-permits. We forget about e-permits. There is a little corruption in the states in permitting, but okay. Um, they, there is, there is, they, um, there's, you know, expediters and craziness, but um, they won an award because they basically took and said, look, e-permits are the foundations of economic development. Everyone needs to do it remote. It's really hard to submit plans remote. It's really hard to do things online. It's old systems. We didn't do it and they did it. And they've had this huge uptick and they're really speeding things along, right? Homeowners are happy. They've got a lot of things going on. So just an example of a backend non-IOT system in Texas that is working really well. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about um, Los Angeles strategic plan, because if you see my theme here is about strategic planning for digital transformation and progress and how we need more of that. So historic moment, lots of things happening. If you don't have a plan, it, what good is it, right? Um, so smart city strategic plan, city of Los Angeles, it's like a 50 page document but they have a plan, right? This is like really, I think, an essential part of where we need to start thinking about things um, and coordinating and taking advantage of the accelerators. So uh, what's next? If we go to the next slide, I just have a couple slides of recommendations. I don't think I have time to really talk in depth about all of these. How much time do I have? I don't know. Hey, can I do these really fast? Okay. Lightning round. This is like the whole point of the presentation and we got three minutes. Okay, well, anyway, uh, I'll send these slides out and we can talk about them later. I think, you know, what's the agenda for smart cities and thinking about the future in this historic moment? Um, new customer requirements, empathy with our customers of all different kinds, providing new services, new capabilities, hybrid experiences, the complexity of hybrid, new workspaces, new skills, um, infrastructure, it's not just physical. We've got to do the digital overlay. We've got to plan and embed things in there because that's going to give you lots of data and information and be really important. And new ecosystems, new partners, new services, new people you should be thinking about, new procurement that have to go through and find all these different cloud providers and how they're going to do it in their catalogs and things like that. All of that is really important. Okay, next slide. 
<laughs> um, so everyone's talking now about the digital first world. Funny, this is my point earlier. I was like, you know, we can talk on and on about the digital first world, but in government and education, which is where I live, it's always going to be a hybrid first world. You're never going to be like purely remote or digital. You're not going to be like a retailer who maybe only has an online shop. It's probably not going to happen, right? So as we can see here, it's really hard to do hybrid properly. And it's really hard to do it seamlessly. We seem to have made some progress with like parking tickets, right? Like I drive in physically, I get a physical, I, I do mobile app to do my, to, to fill the meter, but then I go over and I get a physical ticket and then I go online and I do the ticket. Imagine everything should be like that, right? You can seem, I could walk in and pay for the ticket. I could use cash if I don't regret, right? Everything should be like this kind of thinking about, whoa, they're gonna start here and then they're gonna go here and then they're gonna be physical, then they're gonna be at home, then they'll be a mobile device. And what that means for services and your backend systems and all the other stuff. Um, and I think smart cities play a really important role and I'll, I'll stop here um, about the planning. So this is a little graphic I created. I actually created for the city of Raleigh when we were helping them with their strategic plan, their IT plan, which is typically a town or a city has a city plan. We're gonna have re, you know, um, urban corridor, economic redevelopment, uh, waterfront economic development, oh, our community service says, survey says we need more firefight, whatever. They have a city plan, right? Then the IT department has an IT strategic plan, which is like data center modernization, oh, CRM upgrade, blah, 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 blah. The smart city plan should basically be like the bridge, right? Like I'm focused on the outcomes of the city plan. I get the IT, but the two need to come together somehow for transformation. Why are you doing a CRM upgrade if your biggest thing that needs to happen is more firefighters? I mean, that's a crazy, maybe overly simplistic example, but I think that's sort of where we're at, which is lots of really cool little initiatives that need to be really defined as part of a broader goal. And there needs to be more planning, especially with the disruptors, the accelerators, the inhibitors. <laughs> and I had two more slides, but they'll just remain a secret forever. And I'll take not, questions. Not forever. <laughs> Um, we are at the end of Q&A, but I want to give time for a couple of questions here before we go to break, and then we'll just shorten the break ever so slightly, and we will start the next session at 10.50 instead of 10.45. So it's a great session with city leaders from the four big metro areas of Texas, so we want to make sure you're in your seats at 10.50. But we have time for a couple of questions for Ruth B. now. Uh, for expediency, I'm going to take those from folks in the in-person uh, part of the event for this session. So, questions? Got one in the back there. Now I make it seem like really awesome, right? And there. That's our resident troublemaker asking that one. But yeah, let's. Uh, you want to you want to show the last few couple real quick? Yeah. That's a valid question. Uh, uh, the one before was about questions I think you should be asking when you think about digital first. Uh, so kind of self-explanatory, but I was going to talk about governance and policy and how I really feel like that's, that's important to think about. And then the last slide, this one I was going to spend like a good amount of time on. So this is like a whole nother discussion, which was about the 25 best practices that we benchmark against when we do the smart city maturity model. And I was highlighting some of them that I feel like are really important. Notice none are highlighted under data because they were all important. Um, and I was just gonna really talk about the fact that you need a lot of leadership to kind of get this ball going. And there's, you know, you need some consistency and, you know, to bring all these different areas together and kind of move them all along at the same time. What I'd like to do is give you some time to actually cover these two slides at the very end of the day. We have two sessions at the end. This dovetails very nicely with what Chelsea is going to talk about later. I've lost track of Chelsea. She's in there. She is. This dovetails very nicely with what she's going to talk about in terms of putting together a smart city plan and what our speaker, Amanda, is going to talk about in terms of funding. So maybe we can bring you back up at the end and extend the day just a few minutes at the end to give you time to wrap those two slides into that closing session of homework and what cities should do as they go away. Yep. Awesome. 
And there was one more slide, which was about the technology, because I'm a technology person, and I didn't really talk about technology the whole slide, the whole deck. We've got two technology keynotes yeah. coming up, so we've got that covered. Uh, one more question for Ruth B. For anyone? So I'll repeat for everybody to, so that everybody can hear. On a, on a global basis, who are Ruth B's top few smart cities in the world? I get this question all the time. I hate this question, <laughs> mainly because cities are so fragmented. What you find is one city is really good in one area, but they're not good in all areas. So if I were to say, though, because I've changed my thinking a little bit, and unfortunately, they're really big cities, which I think is a little bit unfair because there's so much happening at mid-sized cities. If I were to think about cities that I think really have their act together, I would say it's the city state of Singapore. Um, they benefit from a top-down structure where they can just make it all happen, which is a little different. But then I'd like, I think London as well has done some organizational changing, some back-end platform changing.